Hey, this week, as we uh, finish up Thanksgiving, as we have this week, I'm going to be focusing, instead of Thanksgiving, because we did that last Sunday, this Sunday, if you can believe it, is the first Sunday of Advent. So today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, I will be doing, uh, moving toward the first Sunday of Advent. And this year, my theme that I'm doing for Advent is the Christmas gift. It's all about the gift that is given to us at Christmas by God. Now, Advent goes way back in the history of the church. It's fairly new for Southern Baptists to be participating in that, but uh, I grew up with it at the, my dad's Methodist church, Mount Zion uh, United Methodist Church is where I was exposed to um, Advent. Most Southern Baptists at that time, if you had any candles involved in anything, that was, whoo, that's Roman Catholic, get that out. We didn't, we didn't do that. So I wasn't exposed to that in the Baptist church. Thankfully, more Southern Baptist churches are doing that today, incorporating this wonderful history of Advent in the life of the church, the colors and the symbolism of Advent and, and that are the symbols that are used at Advent to point to Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful season. It is not Christmas. Christmas uh, comes on Christmas Day, and you have the 12 days of Christmas that are celebratory. Prior to the celebration of Christmas is Advent, four weeks or four Sundays, if you prefer, before Christmas. And those Sundays or before Christmas Eve. And this year comes early because it's coming at the last Sunday of November, which is this, this coming Sunday, November 29th. And so for that reason, we're almost rushed to get in. When, it, when Advent comes early, we're rushed into right after Thanksgiving. Boom, we're right into Advent. And that it's hard to get, kind of get prepared for that. The whole purpose of Advent was to slow down. The whole purpose of Advent was to slow down, become very introspective, and to think about our desperate need for salvation or rescue by God, the, the necessity of a Savior. And it has taken on certain forms. The, there are four candles that are lit, one for each week. The colors uh, originally were uh, purple for, uh, for royalty and for also for sorrow. And uh, a pink candle lit on the third Sunday. And uh, with the third Sunday, there is a transition from, you begin to move from sorrow to celebration. There is this transition, and that candle marks the transition. There are traditional names for those candles, like the angel candle, Mary's candle. Uh, I usually did that Mary and Joseph's candle, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, within Protestant life, it is they have had the general meaning of, let's say, faith, hope, and love, or um, various other names that are given to them. Uh, this year, I, like I said, I'm going to be focusing on the gift, which is really Jesus Christ. I'm not letting a cat out of the bag. That That's something that's known, something that we're moving toward. But you don't jump into the celebration. The brakes are kind of put on. That's what I love about Advent. It slows us down. Instead of this rush to Christmas right after Thanksgiving, uh, there is this putting on the brakes sort of. Let's realize, let's build up to the celebration of Christmas. Let's realize what it's all about. So traditionally, you move from the prophecies about the coming of Christ or the Messiah, uh, and then you move to the telling of the coming of the Messiah, the story itself. And then you have the celebration of the 12 days of Christmas. And then following that, you have Epiphany Sunday, which is usually, it used to be the baptism of Jesus, the wise man, that kind of thing. It's now been narrowed down in, to just the, the focus on the wise men and their journey to discover Jesus Christ. Now, I don't mind doing that story over and over and over and over and over again. I love it, and it's, it's, it, we should observe it every year. We should think on it every year. Because tied to the birth of our Savior is the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Those are the two high days within the church calendar. Um, the, the celebration of Christmas, 
the celebration of Easter or the observance of Christmas, the observance of Easter, um, is to focus our attention upon that. You cannot have the cross of Christ without the birth of Christ. That is significant. And, and you can't just have the birth of Christ without the cross of Christ, but that's just another baby being born. So it's, it's, those two are inextricably tied together, although we celebrate them differently and at different times. Those things encapsulate the year. One uh, is done in the spring of the year. One is done in the fall of the year, the early winter of the year, if you please. Now, this week, we're going to be focusing on the promise of the gift. There is a promise about this gift that God is giving to us, this gift of rescue, but really the person of Jesus Christ through whom the rescue operation is conducted um, by what he does. And I'm turning to the very first instance, the very first mention, the very first suggestion of the unique birth, the virgin birth of the Mashiach, the Messiah, the one who is coming. And it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, if you know the story in the beginning of Genesis, after God's creation uh, and the creation of this marvelous garden of all of the life, you have man, then he creates woman, and they are brought together, and they are the first husband and wife, the first family. And uh, within that, uh, you have uh, sin. Because of the choice of Adam and Eve to reject God as God and chose to worship themselves, uh, to be, they desire to be God themselves, which is the same sin that Satan committed. Uh, he desired to be God, and so so did our first mother and father. And when they made that choice to reject God as God and to set themselves up as God, that they might be equal with God, that's when sin enters into the world, because sin is basically either doing what God has commanded not to do or leaving undone what God has commanded to do. It is to be a rebel, to be a rebel against God, being rebellion against God. It is, uh, it is always idolatry. Sinful acts are the result of that, but it is always a, a result of the sin in the Bible is idolatry. Whatever you place in the place of God, rather than God being God. And that's what Adam and Eve did. And because the result of that, of course, is uh, God comes and he's looking for them. He enjoyed, humanity has enjoyed sweet fellowship with God. This is natural as taking in air and breathing it out. After sin enters the world, they realize... Now there is a separation between them, and they realize it, they know it, and they hid themselves, and they made for themselves fig leaf coverings. Uh, that homemade covering of sin just wasn't good enough, didn't do. So anyway, God comes calling. God comes searching for them. They do not go searching for God. That is the case of all sinful humanity. Uh, it, the Bible says that, that no one uh, seeks after God. Uh, God is the one who seeks after humanity. And, you know, that's the thing about as you study the religions of humanity, for the most part, those religions have it where humanity is in a search for God. The scripture has it just the opposite. It's God who is in search of humanity. God is the one who comes calling on humanity, not humanity going and calling on God. Sinful humanity would just assume there not be a God um, because we like to be God ourselves. Now, having said that, there comes this, uh, this conviction uh, humanity before God, Adam and Eve. And of course the blame game starts and you did this, you did that. Then we get to the curse. Uh, this land is cursed. This world is cursed. Creation is cursed in the sense that, as Paul says, creation has been subject to futility. It cannot achieve what God created it to be because of the sin of humanity. It's through no fault of its own. It's because of our sin. God is holding it back. It cannot achieve what it was created to achieve, all the subhuman created order, without humanity joining uh, that stage because humanity is the crowning part of that creation uh, upon the earth which is to reflect the worship and praise of all creation back to God and we are to reflect unto creation the love, mercy, grace, justice, the image of God so to speak as we live that out, live out that image. But that's become messed up now. And so right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 as the curses are going there is this curse uh, God comes to Satan, because you have done this, cursed uh, are you among all creatures, and you crawl on the belly of the ground, and dust you shall eat, and that kind of thing. Then in verse 15 you have this, and it, it, is, a, it is a wonderful statement. I, and I will put enmity, hostility, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. 
He shall bruise you on the head or grind you on the head, and you shall wound him on the heel. If you like bruise, fine. It can mean bruise, but it can also mean something more severe, to grind, uh, to crush. Uh, he, and I would translate it that way. He shall crush you or grind you on the head, and you shall bruise him or wound him on the heel. And so we're going to stop right there, because that is the first indication in all of Scripture, the first prophecy, the first utterance that there is a rescue operation being put in place, and it's being put in place because of a unique child that's going to be born. There are three things I want to say about that, three things I want us to point out. First of all, notice this. I will put enmity, hostility. Who's going to put it there? God's going to put it there. Between you and the woman. Between the children of the woman, between the, the seed of, of Satan, the demonic forces and all of that, or between the children of the devil, the children of the devil, yes, the scripture speaks of the children of the devil. Who are these children of the devil? All of those who are outside the grace and mercy of God to be found in Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said to those uh, Jewish scoffers and mockers of him and said that you are children of your father, the devil. You're not children of Abraham. You're you're. He was a liar and a murderer, and so were you. Harsh things to say, but Jesus is the one who said them. And so there are two categories of people. There are those who are children of the enemy, and that's true of every human being that's born until we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then those who are saved by grace, um, who are the children of God. And so there is this enmity, and who would deny it? This enmity, this long struggle that God talks about, this struggle between uh, the demonic forces and Satan and, uh, and his children and those who are children of God, this, this struggle, this monumental struggle, not between God and good and evil, but between humanity, between the evil forces that control humanity and those human beings who have been set free from that struggle, from those dark powers. How was it done in the Old Testament? Through faith and obedience to God. How is it done in the New Testament? Through the grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ, where we are liberated from the bondage of sin and death. In the one, there is the covering over. God gave the blood of animals to cover over our sin. In the New Testament, the new covenant, the blood is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us of sin. It just doesn't cover over sin. It cleanses us of sin. We are declared innocent being found in Jesus Christ. And so there is this long struggle that God says is going to take place. And who would deny it? There is a struggle. It is a struggle between the enemy uh, and even the children of God. There is always temptation. The flesh that we still inhabit, uh, that God is not going to fix until we have that resurrected body, that glorified body, we're, and, and we are made perfect, uh, then we will know complete and ultimate peace from that temptation. And won't that be marvelous? Won't that be wonderful? When we're no longer tempted, when we're no longer struggle with failure and not being uh, able to be what we know, what our spirit and what the spirit of God tells us we should be and we long to be. Whether it's an outburst of temper or whether it's something that we say that's mean or ugly or whether we treat someone cruelly or whether we steal from someone, whatever that might be. And in small ways and in large ways, this temptation that we face and our struggles and the failures and the stumblings. And sometimes we, we win the victory over temptation um, through the, the spirit who empowers us and sometimes we stumble and fall. But... God says in the beginning, there's going to be a struggle, and it's going to be a long struggle. And the second thing I would have you notice about that is that he, that's, there's going to be a struggle between you and the woman, and between the seed, the children of the enemy, and her seed. Not the seed of man, but the seed of woman. Now, the most interesting thing about that is women we're not spoken of as having seed. And you need to draw a big circle around this. It's a red flag being waved at you. Hey, look at this. This is something important. When it says the seed of woman, that is unusual. That is unique. This is a uniquely born child. Without the, 
the uh, aid of man without an element of man coming together with that element of woman uh, to that God uses to create a human being. In this case, a human being is going to be created without that agency. God is going to quicken this. God is going to make this happen. So you have the suggestion, the hint, the tantalizing hint of the uniqueness of the virgin birth of the one who is coming. Uh, who is going to put an end to this struggle. So you have the long struggle. Then you have the, the, the suggestion, the, the hint of this unique child that is going to be born without the aid of man that is the seed of woman. Uh, and, you know, we could speak all day about that, but let's move on to the third one. He shall crush your head or grind you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. So what is he saying? What, what he's saying is this child is going to be the one who ends the struggle. This child is going to be the one who destroys evil. This child, is going, it doesn't tell us how. It just says that he's going to. And in the process, he himself will be wounded. He himself is going to have a grinding blow, not a, a crushing blow to the heel rather than the head. Severely wounded. Wounded, yes. Destroyed, no. We get a hint. We don't get the full flavor. This is the beginning of the promise right there at the threshold of sin and death that has entered in to the lives of humanity because of our, our first mother and father, Adam and Eve, because of their choice to, to, to worship something other than God as God. To The idol, in that case, was themselves. Because of that, God's promise that when you do this, death will enter in. And death did enter in in that moment. They are separated. There's a separation, a gulf between God and man, or humanity, if you prefer. And uh, when I say man, I mean generically. I'm sorry, I'm old-fashioned. That's the way I was taught in school, and it's hard for me to get that out. Anyway, actually, I'm not sorry. There you go. So there's the promise. The promise of the gift is right at the threshold of sin and death entering humanity. And we'll see later this week how this didn't catch God by surprise. Uh, we'll focus on that um, either tomorrow or Wednesday. I'm not sure which, and it doesn't really matter. We'll get there. My point I want to make today is God promised from the very beginning that one would come who would liberate humanity from the struggle between the demonic forces and the kingdom of light. That struggle that we all know about, that struggle that every human being knows exists. And when we are liberated by faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, then we see more clearly the struggle that is taking place. You remember what, uh, what is said in Scripture, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul tells us we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the, the rulers and authorities and the powers, uh, the spiritual powers of darkness that want to control us. But in Christ Jesus, we're set free. And so as we begin to move toward Advent, as we begin to move toward Christmas through Advent, I should say, then the first thing that we do is realize that there has been a promise made by God that he would rescue his creation in a uniquely born child of woman who would destroy the evil corruption that has tainted the creation of God, the good creation of God. I'm excited to walk through um, Advent with you. I've never gotten to do that on video devotions and that kind of thing. Um, I try to narrow it down just to one thing. I, I don't want to exegete scripture through this. I try to narrow it down to one thing uh, that we're focusing on. So this week we're focusing on the promise, the promise of the Savior, the promise of the one who will rescue the uniquely born child of woman without the agency of man that God brings about. We know him as Yeshua. Jesus, God is salvation. I pray that you know him through faith. I pray that you know the deliverance from the bondage of sin and death. And I pray that you know the joy that comes from being liberated from that, being set free from those dark powers that want to control us. And I pray that, that, that the peace of that knowledge of knowing God through faith in Jesus Christ uh, dwells with you always. Hey, listen, I love you. More importantly, God loves you, and he gave his son, Jesus Christ, that one who's uniquely born, so that you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, 
and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that you know that. Hey, listen, I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, God bless you.